Uh, my name is Martin Mayani. My capstone is on machine learning and object recognition for autonomous vehicles, and my faculty advisor is Dr. T. And um, the idea behind this uh, project is that automakers such as GM, Ford, and BMW, and even on demand organizations such as Uber, and software development companies, talk of Amazon, talk of Google, they are all investing a lot of money, billions of dollars, into making autonomous vehicles operational and safe. And that is an indication that machine learning is here, and it's here to stay. And this has created a fiercely co competitive market for both hardware and software engineers with expertise in this field. And somebody has to respond. So educators have to respond. How do they respond? By creating infrastructures that can effectively compete with the high cost of uh, developing an actual self-driving car for testing. It is with that idea in mind that we thought of a project to create a cost-effective environment that can be used to study and understand the functionality of autonomous vehicles. We don't have access to an autonomous car. Why? They're very expensive. They're way out of our reach. So we decided to build a small working electronic model of an autonomous car that you see here. And we developed machine learning algorithms, which are classifiers that we did uh, develop. And we use a Raspberry Pi camera module, which is mounted on the car that you see here, to be able to do object recognition. And the materials that we use for this project are um, Number one, which was really important to, uh, for this project, was a Raspberry Pi, and that's a Raspberry Pi. A Raspberry Pi is basically a small computer. And uh, we had a go by go kit, and these are the parts uh, that I did put together to build my model of a car that you see here. Uh, we also used OpenCV. OpenCV is an open source uh, software for computer vision. We also used Anaconda distribution which is an open platform that has over 700 um, Python modules that are really useful for data science and machine learning. And uh, out of the so many modules that are there, the ones that were really important to this project were NanPy, which is for numerical operations, Second Run, which is a uh, machine learning library in Anaconda, and Matplotlib, which is used for data visualization. And we also use a computer and a wireless demo to connect the computer, uh, the laptop, and the Raspberry Pi together. So a little bit of background information. What is machine learning? Machine learning is a branch of artificial intelligence that deals with creating computer algorithms that are capable of learning from the data they analyze and process without any additional programming. And if you talk to people from the people in the business world, they'll tell you that data is the new oil that's filling the business industry. So we have to figure out how to make uh, to extract meaningful information from the data which is available to us. How do we do that? The answer to that is machine learning. And uh, that brings me to, uh, actually I meant to talk about uh, the, the classifications of machine learning. Uh, one is supervised learning. Supervised learning is where you classify observations into predefined classes. And, uh, and supervised learning is kind of similar to supervised learning except that in unsupervised, there are no predefined classes. In fact, the main objective of the algorithm is to classify um, those observations and establish the existence of uh, clusters based on the similarities of the observations. And reinforcement learning is where a computer algorithm or a computer program discovers behavior through its interaction with uh, its environment. You can think of it like maybe chess, a, game, like a, chair, uh, a computer program playing chess it discovers the winning strategy, and it goes down over and over again to perfect it. And that brings me to my favorite quote about uh, machine learning, which I think is an excellent definition of machine learning by Tom Mitchell, who is a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. He says that a computer program is said to learn from experience E with respect to some task T and some performance measure P if its performance on T as measured by P improves with experience. So a computer program has to get better when it does something over and over again. And there are some uh, performance measures that are used to evaluate the performance of the program. 
a little bit of historical information. Um, research and development of autonomous vehicles date back to the 1900s. In most cases, we didn't predict, well, maybe something just like a decade or two ago. We actually started earlier than that. And since then, there has been significant progress, not only in research, but also in legislation of autonomous vehicles. And actually, the US uh, NHTSA has uh, established a classification system for autonomous vehicles with four levels. So level one is a traditional car that a human driver is in full control. Level two is a vehicle with at least one autonomous system, which is function specific. So same thing, something like maybe lane centering. <coughs> and then level two has at least two uh, autonomous systems that work in unison. Say, say one that um, change lanes, and the, the one that looks around to see if it's safe to change lanes. And level three is an autonomous car with le uh, limited autonomy, so a human driver has to be there to take order in certain occasions. And level four is 100% autonomous car that the, driver, the human driver doesn't have to be there at all. Um, the 11% take orders, whenever you talk about transportation, everything that you can think of has to do with transportation. So this is just but a short list of the stakeholders. But, uh, but these are ones that I thought they were really interesting. So Ford invested $1 billion to a startup artificial intelligence company that most of us have not even heard about it. It's Argo AI, uh, which is a company who are the, one of the co-founders was actually working for the Google autonomous car project. But he created Google and then started his own artificial intelligence company with uh, alongside other people. And uh, they did that with a goal to have a level four vehicle on the road by 2021. And uh, GM and Lyft also did a $500 million agreement, which sounds like a natural agreement because Lyft are so good at making people ride in vehicles of the general one. And General Motors has also been manufacturing vehicles and even working on uh, autonomous vehicles for the last decade. Google, uh, the autonomous Google, Google Sky project is now Waymo, which is a company independent of Google now. Actually, so Waymo, which means way forward mobility. And uh, the reason is also uh, think that these autonomous vehicles would have increased processing power. And that provides an opportunity for the chip makers, such as Intel. Actually, I think you know, uh, Intel uh, has started supplying chips to BMW. And of course, educators. Uh, institutions are investing a lot of money into studying program, data science and machine learning programs. Talk of MIT, Stanford, and um, Carnegie Mellon, where Uber, in 2015, bought a whole class of 40 students, including their professor, to help them develop uh, uh, self-autonomous cars, algorithms. And educators, like, it's, uh, like UVA, UVA is just like neighboring uh, our neighbors here. They started at Data Science Institute like two years ago, and it's now super competitive. I think in every year there's like at least 500 applicants for only 50 available spots. So what is the process of training and testing a machine learning algorithm? Now let's look at a um, single example. Say for instance you are trying to train a computer program that can recognize a digit A or number A. So uh, step number one, you would get thousands and thousands of variations of number A. And you need variations of them. Just like if I told everyone to write an A, we all are not going to write the same A, right? So you need thousands and thousands of variations of A. And then there are a couple of pre-processing steps that you take before uh, applying your data set into the classifier. Those steps are grayscaling. You have to grayscale your images, reshape them, and resize them. So like in this case, we turn our A into an uh, 8 by 8 pixel. And from there, we turn it into a NumPy array. And you can see the 8 by 8 pixel, it has nine, uh, eight, it has eight rows and eight columns. And from there, we turn that NumPy array, we flood it into a long line of numbers. That line of numbers represent the pixel intensities. And you can see the lighter areas are the ones that we see. And the darker areas are the uh, zeros. So this, basically, these are the features that describe the A. So you're telling your computer algorithm, next time you see these numbers, you should know that that is an A. They may vary because the A's that we write will vary, but they shouldn't vary that much. So every time your computer algorithm sees that, say, I saw that before, this looks like an A. 
And if you think about it, that's how we learned as kids when we were growing up. Your mom kept on telling you, hey, this is a tree. It's a tree because it has branches. It has leaves. And they told you that over and over again. So that is exactly what we do for uh, computer programs. And now, after training, you are sitting, it's ready for testing. So you can test your program with data that you haven't seen before. So data that you haven't used for training. So you can provide with a data and be like, hey Siri, what is that? And it goes, and A, which is a correct prediction. And this is something simple that we can also, we can do from open source platform, such as like, the ones I mentioned before. And in fact now, I'm gonna switch just a little bit and do a simple demo of how to do that. So this is a Jupyter notebook, which is part of the Anaconda platform that I mentioned. So step number one that you do is import the Python modules that you need to develop a particular uh, algorithm. And so Jupyter notebook lets you run block of codes, of code. So that in that case, I'm gonna go ahead and run the first cell, which is basically importing my modules. That in, no errors, so that's good. And uh, we may want to take a look at the kind of images that we are feeding to our classifier. So this is, if I write this, so that's uh, one image of the many images that I used to train my classifier. Uh, it's showing that it's, uh, this is, these are the dimensions of our image. 255, uh, 225 by 225, and that three just represents curve. And the next step would be to load your images and resize them. I want to resize them to 16 by 16 pixels because that's easy to work with. So if you look at uh, my code, I said row equals to column equals to 16. That's basically to set um, the size of the pixel into a 16 by 16 pixel. And the rest of the code is just uh, showing me uh, the path to the directory where the images are stored in my computer. And the next step would be to turn my image dataset into an NumPy array. So, but first I have to run my code here to make sure my images are loaded. They're loaded, there's no errors, so good. Um, next step would be turn them into an NumPy array. Five is good, no errors. <laughs> <laughs> so the next step is to actually visualize the images that were loaded and actually make sure they were loaded. So if I did that, so yeah, my images were loaded. But something's funny because I only have 15 images. <laughs> and I said, you need thousands and thousands of images. Yeah, I know, that is ridiculous. But you know, it works for demonstration purposes, right? <laughs> So the next step is set the target. So to set the target, and actually I may want to confirm to see that I loaded the right images, and if I go back to my directory where I stored my images, uh, my the images that I have, they look something similar to what I have in my directory. So that is what I have, and so yeah. So the next step is set the target. Setting the target is basically saying what I think is a right arrow and what I think is not a right arrow. So if you look at this, I said number of uh, index four. Index four does not look like a right arrow to me. So I said it's not. So I said I give it a zero. And what is a right arrow, I give it a one. So yeah, if you look here at my, I saw you just count one, two, three, four. It has to be five because five of index is data starting from zero. So that would be number five. So I said number five equal to zero because I don't think it's the right arrow. And next step would be flattening my data set. And I flattened my pixels here, run that other set of code, and that worked. And if you look at it, you can kind of see the shape of the arrow. The high numbers represent the wide areas and the dark areas are the low numbers. 
So you can kind of see it. So the line was here. You can see the row numbers here. You basically get the shape of that area, that pixel. So because I printed out index 0, so my index 0 looks something like that. So now, the moment of truth, and see how our classifier works. Right, run that other set of code. Hopefully, it gets an 88. You got an error. <laughs> oh, that was not good. Uh, maybe because I didn't do this. I don't think you ran up one before. Yep. Yeah. So I ran that. I didn't have the target. I think that's why I didn't run. Things you do. We start the kernel and run all. That's safe. Yeah. It takes a minute to process it. Yeah, you can see it's it's busy. Uh, the moment of truth is here. <laughs> so my class file got an eighty-eight percent, and you can see. So here, you can even see from this confusion. This a confusion matrix that you can uh, see what it got. So this six. It says out of the, there's, this, there's a total of eight um, predictions here. If you add up the numbers, they add up to eight. Um, out of the eight, it thought like six of them were right arrows, and they did what? And here, it thought one of them was not a right arrow, and it wasn't. But you got what wrong. So seven out of eight would give you an 88%. So our class one did good. And from there, we will switch back to the Presentation. So this linear class bar actually didn't work great. So because it didn't work great, I looked at another class bar, which is a hard cascade class bar. The hard cascade class bar is trained on negative and positive images. And actually, our demo that we'll do next runs on a hard cascade class bar which we will eventually transfer that code to the Raspberry Pi, and that will control the car. And so we are going to look at a demo of that. So I have um, this camera right here, and I have <coughs> some code that I trained. We trained uh, to, be to be able to recognize a right turn uh, L. So um, I expect it to be able to see a right error. Another thing now, it's being uh, distracted by the any white surface. But you can kind of say that. And if I move it, it's being distracted by this. <laughs> and even reflections. So. See, he either sees this or a reflection of this, or even this one's here. See, it is. <laughs> well, now it's just it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> and it should see the one, the reflection on the and table. See, yeah, he also sees the reflection yeah. on the table. Okay, so we get some false positives and yeah. it's working. And it's, it has also actually also been trained to be able to recognize faces. For some reason, you want to recognize my face. Ah, uh, but uh, you want to recognize his face. <laughs> but if anybody's standing there, will recognize you. Yeah, if somebody, can, if somebody stands here, you will be able to recognize your face. For some reason, you can Project it was a completely, completely new topic, so I had no idea uh, when I started. But I think I learned a lot. And also, the main really challenging step in data science is gathering your data set. To begin with, we thought we'd be able to train our classifier using um, using the linear support vector that we tried, but it didn't really work. I used a data set of 2,000 images. And it was just, I couldn't download 2,000 images. See, there were 2,000 images. So I don't, I don't some code that would download images. And then that code only downloaded like 20. And then when I run it again, it goes to the web and downloads the exact 20. And I need variations of those. So 
So we wrote some other code in uh, Keras and TensorFlow that would make 100 variations of each of the 20 images. So in total, we got a data set of 2,000. But with that, we got an accuracy of 50%. <laughs> and what that really means is that it has a 50% chance of getting a stop, uh, stop sign <laughs> or a red line. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone wants that. <laughs> so that's why we changed uh, yes and looking at the hard casket. And also trading the algorithm to improve accuracy. We tried everything that we could uh, using a huge data set to improve the accuracy, tried other means, but it didn't really work. But we're glad that the hard casket finally worked. And future work, um, a rising uh, senior is taking over my project, and they will be working with uh, Dr. Tit to add ultra sensors to the car. And of course, first transfer the code to the car. And then from there, add ultra sensors, which will enable the car to detect uh, objects and even distance from other uh, vehicles on the road. So they basically, well, in this case is going to be um, other, they're going to make so many uh, other medical uh, versions of this car. And that will enable them to share knowledge. Because that's what Google and Teresa are doing. They have uh, vehicles driving on the road, and they upload that knowledge into a cloud that is shared by a fleet of vehicles. So one vehicle is driving in Arizona, another one is driving in California, and they all upload the same road conditions into a cloud that is shared by all of them. So one that hasn't even been to California has the road conditions in California. Knows how it works there because the knowledge has been applied to a cloud. And um, conclusion, there are many um, powerful open source platforms that can be used for academic purposes to understand the functionality of autonomous vehicles. Uh, such as Anaconda that I mentioned before. And actually, earlier this week, Anaconda and IBM announced a partnership of IBM allowing Anaconda to use their cognitive uh, systems, which is a really huge boost for the data science community. I think that's gonna uh, change things. And uh, these platforms are also easy to understand and offer a great understanding of what exactly the tech giants are doing in the, world, uh, in the real world that we can't afford here. And our Raspberry Pi in car, I think you also served a uh, really working model of an autonomous uh, vehicle. So I really want to thank Dr. Tate. I'm really grateful for his inspiration, ideas, and over guide us through this journey. I definitely wouldn't have been able to accomplish this if it wasn't for your help. So thank you so much, and uh, thank you everyone. They can, other companies did, like uh, kind of like how Argo AI is a startup that we don't even know. But when it came into the market, uh, big companies like Ford went for them. So it's business dynamics, which is kind of challenging, but I think definitely it's positive. There, there are two, in the news today, there are two uh, ex Googlers, uh, in fact, there's a, a third person doing some business capital. They just uh, decided to uh, create something called it. Google created something called a tensor processing unit. It's a chip uh, that Google says will, will beat the, the GPUs that NVIDIA and AMD and people like that are using to process large data sets. Uh, but they're entering into the hardware side of this, which is a really tough market to get in because Intel, NVIDIA, AMD, and people like that have a, have a you know, sort of like a cap on that a market. But Google, these ex Googlers think they've come up with something that's so fascinating, they think it's going to revolutionize AI, AI hardware processing. And so you should keep an eye on that. Um, uh, I keep an eye on those things because I'm invested in AMD. And uh, I was losing a lot of money with them, but <laughs> now I'm making a lot of money with them because of, the, because of the graphical processing units that are used, not the CPUs, but the GPUs that are used to process the large data sets that we, that we need. So, yeah, I think, I think, it, I think there's. I think they're crazy to get into the hardware market, but I think it's fiercely competitive. 
uh, AI, machine learning is going to revolutionize uh, you guys' lives. Um, and it's doing it now in ways that you don't even think about. And you're helping it by um, your Facebook pages and your Twitter accounts and all that kind of good stuff. Right? So like, if like the code and all this is going down perfectly, would it would you be able to scale it up to like a full size vehicle? Or is this just for the model or this is the code that you wrote? Uh, the goal of our project was mainly to develop like just a small scale that can be used in institutions just to teach people the functionalities of uh, self-driving cars. But I mean, I mean, if it was like a good model, then that is the potential. To, to be honest, uh, if we look at how we process the image, we use these classifiers, you mentioned look, uh, linear support vector classifier and the Harkade classifier. Uh, but when, uh, we, when we really take this thing and embed it into the fleet of cars, James is gonna, <laughs> going to do all this stuff and we're going to actually have these cars communicating. Well, hopefully we will be able to do convolutional neural nets. That's an artificial neural net that we're going to um, train to recognize uh, these images and things of this kind. We, uh, we're hopeful that we'll be able to get that done. You, uh, we got a year or so to do and James is pretty sharp so he'll probably figure it out. Uh, we'll, we'll, get it, we'll get it done. So we think that we think that we'll be able to use the, the whole idea was to give students a chance to to do the, play with the kind of techniques that they use in real self-driving cars, uh, learn what machine learning algorithms are, uh, uh, how to train them, uh, the tedious task of downloading and getting the data uh, to work. And then when you train these things, uh, you know, it might take a, sometimes a few, uh, a few minutes, sometimes several days to train them, and then you run them and test them, and then you find out that you're, it won't, we got a stop sign that we're trying to get to recognize, and, uh, it might recognize it uh, four out of ten times. <laughs> so you're killing six people. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it just takes a lot of work, but we, we think the convolution neural nets and things are going to improve the accuracy. Uh, and that's more in line with what people are doing uh, in terms of recognizing um, uh, objects and, and, and picking out the features. It's, it's quite a tedious process, but, but he at least now understands the steps that it takes to, to do that. And James hopefully is going to have these cars talking to each other and doing all that kind of stuff, right? How much do you think the camera plays a role in accurately predicting the, like for example, the stop sign example, do you think a higher quality camera would be able to detect it, detect it better or does it more play a role in the software? I think it probably would be able to do that. Um, actually, when we did it, we also did it in a different environment, like we did in, in the lab and we did it here. We get, we get a lot of false positives here compared to when you do it from another environment. So, yeah. Yeah, the lighting and all that stuff. Yeah, lighting, all that affects the uh, detection. The ability of the camera to detect objects. All right. Thanks. Great job.